the periodic table, elements and physical chemistry exam papers on the OCRA specification for A-level chemistry have got multiple choice. The first 15 questions are all multiple choice questions and the mark scheme, whilst it does deliver of course the right answers, doesn't provide any explanation about why that is the right answer. So for this 2017 version of the paper one, periodic table, elements and physical chemistry, I'm going to take you through the answers and explain why each one is as it appears in the mark scheme. So with question one just here, we've got which atom is not an isotope of iodine? So we've got a number of neutrons down here. We've got the mass number for these individual isotopes of iodine or supposed isotopes of iodine. The atomic number of iodine is 53 on the periodic table. So what you can see I've done down here is I've taken the mass numbers and I've subtracted from them the atomic number to get what should be the correct number of neutrons. Now going down the list we can see that it matches up for all of them until we get to the very final one where we would expect a number of neutrons equal to 76 but actually the table has 77. And so the correct answer here is D. Option D is not an isotope of iodine because the number of neutrons is incorrect from this mass number. Moving down to question two. This one is a matter of fact. This is from module five, although they've hidden it a little bit here by calling the type of bonding between the ligands and the metal ion in that complex ion structure dative covalent. You would traditionally describe this as coordinate bonding when you study this in the specification. So a little bit hidden there, but it is a matter of fact answer. The type of bonding is dative covalent. Next one is oxidation number of manganese in K2MnO4. Now, here we don't know the oxidation number of the manganese, but we are to assume, therefore, common oxidation states for the other elements listed in this formula. So we do know that potassium has a common oxidation state of plus one, and oxygen has a common oxidation state of negative two. I've got two lots of the potassium, and I've got four lots of the oxygen, and I have no ionic charge overall on the formula, which means all the pluses equal all the minuses here. So in order to get that balance and in order to match this negative eight coming from all those oxygens and considering the positive two from the potassiums, the manganese would need to be plus six. Only then do all the pluses equal the minuses here for this formula. So the correct answer there was C. So for question four, which calcium compound contains the greatest percentage by mass of calcium? We don't have any mass values in this, so what we're going to have to use is molar mass for this, but that's absolutely fine. For the calcium, the molar mass is, as you can see up here, and I've used the periodic table to get this, it's 40.1 grams per mole. And what I need to do is get the largest percentage possible. And when we look at the calculation, we're going to be taking that 40.1, having that as the numerator, and then the denominator is the total molar mass of the formula. Now, you were given names here, so this is quite time consuming. But you can see here, I've got all the correct formula all the way down. If you don't know your formula and you don't know your ions here, you're going to hit a real hurdle with this question. So you're not able to access the quality of the question unless you actually know that, for instance, calcium nitrate has got two of that nitrate ion in its structure. What I need to do is keep this total molar mass down. I need to keep that quantity as small as possible in order to get as big a percentage as I possibly can by molar mass. And so the one that comes out here as having the smallest denominator is going to be when I have calcium hydroxide, because as you can see here in this yellow highlighted section, 60 compared to 124 compared to 34 and 96.1 means that the smallest denominator is for the calcium hydroxide, which would give me the largest percentage by mass of calcium, and therefore the correct answer here is C. Moving on to question five. For question five, I've got a mole value, which is a bit unusual in a question, but it's 0.02 mole of calcium oxide is reacted completely with two mole of HCl. What's the volume in centimetres cubed of HCl with two mole per decimeter cubed as its concentration required for this reaction? Well, first off, we need this reaction equation. We weren't given that by the question because without it, you don't know that the ratio here is one to two. So maybe that's why they've used moles here because there's an added demand of knowing that ratio and being able to access the question that way. 
The ratio between the calcium oxide and the HCl is 1 to 2. So I'm going to double the number of moles of the calcium oxide given by the question. And that's the number of moles, 0.04, of HCl required to react all of those calcium oxide moles. I'm then going to turn that into a volume, knowing the concentration here is 2 mole per decimeter cubed. So that's now 0.04 over 2 times a thousand because the answer has been asked for in centimeters cubed and if i just do this without the times thousand i get an answer in decimeters cubed the correct answer here comes out as b how many electrons are removed from 2.02 .02 times 10 to the power of minus 2 grams of neon atoms to form gaseous neon single plus ions that's question six now this question is a little odd really because if you know what a first ionization energy is, and you can write the equation like you can see here, the number of electrons removed is the same as the number of gaseous atoms we had. So I suppose they're kind of testing your knowledge of that, but it's quite a simple fact, really. So all we need to do is find out how many neon atoms there are in this mass value. It's just a bit of a small mass, that's all. So we use a traditional calculation for this of moles equals mass divided by molar mass, using the one from the periodic table here, 20.2 for neon. That gives me a mole value of 1 times 10 to the power of negative 3, or 0 0.001, if you will. Then I'm going to multiply that by the Avogadro constant, which is on the data sheet, and it gives me the correct answer here of C. Moving on to question 7. For question 7, silicon can be made by heating silicon tetrachloride with zinc, and you've got an equation this time, but I do need that molar mass. That's quite a common theme in this. I've noticed all the way through up to this point, we're having to figure out a lot of molar masses using relative atomic mass values from the periodic table. So that's quite extensive here. Um, I am surprised by that, but it is interesting to note, if you're doing these multiple choice questions in the future, how often we've had to do this historically. 8.5 grams of SiCl4 is reacted with an excess of zinc. The percentage yield of silicon, and that's going to be over here, is 90%. What is the mass of silicon made? Right, so it's quite similar to one of the previous questions, actually. We're going to find out the moles of the SiCl4 just here. We're going to ratio across to the silicon, which is one to one, to know how many moles of silicon would get uh, produced, and that would be the maximum number of moles that could be produced. But then we're going to multiply that mole value by 0.9 because that's going to give us that 90% yield. And so we figure out the model amount by using our traditional knowing the number of moles here, ratio across to the number of moles there. But then we take that mole value and multiply it by 0.9 to find out what a 90% yield would be. I then convert that into a mass by multiplying by the molar mass and I'm going to use 28.1, which is the relative atomic mass value of silicon from the periodic table, but that's my molar mass quantity for silicon as well. And that gives me a mass value answer of 1.26 grams, which is option A. Moving on to question eight. Four pairs of solutions are mixed. Which pairs of solutions forms a white precipitate. So what I always do for these is each structure is usually going to have two ions in it. There's only one of these that doesn't, and that's the um, NH3, the ammonia, further down. And what I tend to do is, as you can see here, for each of the combinations, I jot out what the known ions are. So you really need to know your qualitative analysis sections here of modules uh, five and three to be able to answer this well. And I look at what combinations give me what precipitates I need. So there's nothing in the first one, which is just as important as having one, remember? For B, you can see that for module 3, I've got AGBR, which is a cream precipitate. For C, these two actually are going to form an orange-brown precipitate of FeO3, uh, sorry, FeOH3, which is the uh, iron 3 hydroxide precipitate. That's in module 5. And then down here, back in module 3 again, we've got barium sulfate, which is a white precipitate, and that's in the specification when we talk about barium ions being used to test for the presence of sulfate ions, the SO42 minus. So the correct answer here was D. Moving on with question nine. Question nine is a nice module three um, average bond enthalpy question. 
And so here we've been asked to find out what the bond enthalpy is in kilojoules per mole of the HI bond. So we actually have the enthalpy change of this reaction just here. It's negative 9. And we know because of the data we've got in the table, the calculation we need is bonds broken minus bonds formed equals the enthalpy change. What we don't have is the bond form value, which is for the hydrogen iodide. Please notice there are two moles here of HI, and so the quantity we get at the end is going to need dividing by two. What I need to do is rearrange this equation as a subject of the 2x in this version you can see written below. That gives me a 2x value of 596, which is actually in the table. There it is. And so that's luring us in there to thinking that we're at the end of this, but we've got that 2 in front of the HI, and so per bond of it, it's going to be 298, or per mole of the bond, I should say. I also wanted to point out here that A and B definitely couldn't be the right answers because bond enthalpies have to be positive values, and so that was a nice way of getting rid of them straight away. For question 10... Module 5, once again, we've got some graph shapes that we are expected to know, this time concentration time graphs. I have noticed that rate concentration graphs come up in this way as well. And we need to know that since A is zero order, which graph is the correct shape? So again, you've got to learn your graph shapes. Your correct shape here is A, so correct answer here was A. But it is worth noting that B would have been for first order. C actually isn't for any of them, that just suggests there's no reaction taking place. And this graph is going the wrong way because reactant concentrations don't increase over time, they decrease. So that curve's going the wrong direction. Moving on to question 11. Chromium 3 plus ions are reacted with an, excess, an excess of aqueous sodium hydroxide. So this is actually quite similar to the reaction I was talking about with the qualitative analysis earlier to make that iron 3 hydroxide precipitate. Which product is formed? It's definitely not these two. These aren't really anything that we study at A-level, so hopefully you recognise them as not things you're expected to have learnt. These two, however, are things that come up in the A-level. Now, when an excess of aqueous sodium hydroxide is used, we do make this top structure here. Often written as a complex ion, though, so normally we'd have uh, square brackets here um, on either side of the formula with the 3 minus on the outside, but it's not that big a deal. This chromium hydroxide here, so the chromium 3 hydroxide there, that's actually what would be made if it was dropwise written here instead of excess, and it would be a precipitate instead. For question 12, we've got two strong monobasic acids, and they're being mixed together, and we need to find out what the hydrogen ion concentration is in the resulting solution. Well, they are strong monobasic acids, and so what that tells me is their concentrations are equal to their respective concentrations of H+, and also linked to that, their mole values are actually equal to their mole values of H+, because they dissociate completely in aqueous solution. So for each of them, I'm going to find out their mole values from their concentrations and volumes. I've done that just here. That gives me their moles of H+, which I add together to give me a total H+, value. And then I'm going to turn that total H+, into a concentration of H+, using the volume of both solutions added together, since the question told me they've been mixed. And the correct answer there comes out as 4.07, but that's going to be 4.1, option C, because they're only given to one decimal place. Question 13. A mixture of N2 and O2 gases have a total pressure of 1.42 atmospheres. The mole fraction of the N2 is 0.7. What's the partial pressure in atmospheres of O2 in the mixture? Well, straight away, I know the mole fraction for the oxygen is going to be a 0.3 because mole fractions have to add up to 1 for a sample of a gas. And so the fact that the nitrogens is 0.7 tells me that the oxygens is 0.3. So a quick fact there. Partial pressure is then calculated by doing the mole fraction multiplied by the total pressure, and so my correct answer here is B. That's a nice quick one. Question 14, quite wordy actually. A cell is constructed from the two redox systems below. Which statement or statements is or are correct for the cell? So I don't even look at the options down here for this. What I'm going to do is decide, as you can see here, which ones are true and false from the statements up here. First one, the cell potential is 1.14 volts. Well, we can have a quick go at this. So as you can see here, I've done the working out, but let me explain where I got the numbers from for this. 
So I've got reduction minus oxidation just here. So when I'm comparing the two electrode potentials together, the equilibrium or the redox system, I can say, that has the less positive or more negative, its position of equilibrium is going to shift to the left. So it's going to become the oxidation half cell. And the other one is going to shift to the right. So that becomes my reduction half cell. And so then I do reduction minus oxidation. So here I've got the reduction, 0.8, minus the oxidation, 0.34. And I get a cell potential here of 0.46 volts. So that means that one's wrong. The reaction at the copper electrode is going to be in the oxidation direction. Well, yeah, it absolutely is. I just described that, actually. I said because its electrode potential was less positive, its position of equilibrium shifts to the left, and that's exactly what this reaction would then look like. So I know that's going to be what's happening at the copper electrode, so I gave that one a tick. The silver electrode increases in mass. Again, absolutely. I talked about how this one had a more positive electrode potential, so its position of equilibrium shifts to the right, so it's going to be silver ions add an electron to make silver, and if I'm making more silver, then that metal electrode in that beaker of solution is going to get bigger. So it's going to increase in mass. Correct answer here then is option C, because it's statements two and three only. So for question 15, we've got some unusual electron configuration questions here. Chromium and copper have got those odd electron configurations. When it gets to the regular filling of uh, 3D after 4S, when you get to chromium and copper, there's a little bit of a tweak where we end up actually with a half filled 4S each time and a little bit of an unusual either part filling for chromium or complete filling of 3D for copper, as you can see just below it. So these are actually the slightly unusual electron configurations for chromium and copper, so they're correct. Iron doesn't do that. In fact, no other element does it for the transition elements that we study in A-level. So iron isn't going to get this half-filled treatment just here, especially not for its plus two. It is going to be 3D6 for that iron uh, two plus because we're going to lose all the electrons from here rather than one from each. So the correct answer here is one and two only, which is B. Hopefully you found the coverage of these multiple choice question answers a bit more informative than the existing mark scheme, which is just all the letters, and hopefully now you can see where those answers came from. If you did find the video helpful in that way, then I'd really appreciate it if you could leave a like before you go so that YouTube knows I still exist. And until next time, happy revising.